Hello everyone, and welcome to The Suburban Wasteland, with me, Echo Gecko. In this new miniseries, I plan on making a selection of shorter videos to explore the consequences of America's unique course of urban development, namely, auto-centric, low-density suburban sprawl. Its consequences cover nearly every issue facing America today, from the impoverishment of the middle class to political radicalization, environmental catastrophe, cultural stagnation, and the collapse of American physical and mental health. In this inaugural episode, I will discuss the most practical, yet most underreported, suburban catastrophe, how suburban life impoverishes its residents and drains the financial blood of its governments. This is pretty counterintuitive. Since World War II, it's the cities in America that declined into financial disaster, climaxing in 1975 when New York City nearly went bankrupt. When they think about cities, many Americans still imagine the Chicago of the Blues Brothers. How often does a train go by? So often you won't even notice it. Yet most recently, it's been suburbs and states, not cities, that have seen fiscal crises. Poverty has been moving in as well. In the last decades, poor neighborhoods grew by 54% in the suburbs. Compare that to 18% in the cities. The number of poor people living in suburbs has grown by 65%. Between 2000 and 2015 alone, poverty in the Atlanta suburbs grew by 126%, in Austin suburbs by 129%, and in Las Vegas suburbs by 139%, more than doubling in all three of those suburban areas. In fact, the entire suburban economic reality is unraveling, with the retail apocalypse dismantling big box stores like Sears and Macy's, leaving malls the focal point of bygone suburban life and tax base, vacant. The fundamental problem is one we'll be constantly returning to in this series. Density. Expansive suburbs in general are a historical anomaly. But even in the modern world, American suburbs are especially spread out. Compare, for example, this image of a typical Australian and American suburb. Fewer people means less tax revenue which might not seem important because there's fewer people to provide services to. However, it's not actually that much cheaper to provide services, like roads or utilities, to fewer people if they're really spread out. In fact, low density can increase many per capita infrastructure costs dramatically. If homes are more spread out, you're going to need a lot more pipe to get water to each of them. You're also going to need a lot more road to reach them all. The U.S. has over 2,000 kilometers of roads per 100,000 people, compared to two-thirds of that in France, a third of that in Germany, and not even a quarter of that in equally large China. One study found that nearly two-thirds of downtown surface area of famously decentralized Los Angeles was dedicated to roads and parking at its peak, part of a much larger trend across the U.S. This isn't just some marginal difference, either. One study conducted by a Milwaukee suburb in 1992 found that the taxes on a new single-family home only covered half of the city's future cost of services to that house. More recent analyses are even more pessimistic. The non-profit Strongtowns has estimated that new suburbs can only ever hope to cover a fifth of their long-run infrastructure obligations and one expert estimates that it costs nearly three times as much to deliver basic government services to a suburban home compared to an otherwise equivalent urban residence. We're already seeing the effects with the near depletion of the National Highway Trust Fund and with the drastic taxes being proposed by states to cover skyrocketing road maintenance costs. For example, the Illinois Economic Policy Institute found that the state would have to spend $21 billion a year just to repair its existing infrastructure. That's out of a state budget of only 36 billion. Two thirds of the entire state budget would have to go to maintenance just to tread water. A 2015 study by the London School of Economics estimated that sprawl costs America a trillion dollars every year to maintain compared to a more compact urban alternative. The urban exception that proves the rule is Detroit. Despite having a dense urban core, most of the city is actually fairly low-density single-family housing. The sort of middle density cities like Chicago are famous for just doesn't exist there. 
what density they had emptied out over recent decades, essentially converting Detroit into a massive suburb. On the eve of its recent bankruptcy, the largest municipal bankruptcy in U.S. history, the diagnosis was universal. The city was too big for its tax base. It wasn't feasible to provide services to such a small population over such a large area. This didn't just happen because the people in Detroit are generally poor. Studies by strong towns and associated groups have found that cities operate rich outer suburbs at a loss, made up for by revenue from poor, core areas. Run-down inner-city properties are often more valuable than new modern suburban ones. Even at the incredible amounts of property tax charged on suburban McMansions, wealthy suburbs struggle to pay for infrastructure in the long term. Here's an example using data from one Texas town. Local governments typically rely on property taxes to pay the bills, meaning that you pay a percentage of the value of the buildings you own. But note the trend in the green bars. As the size of the property increases, the value of the structure doesn't increase. Now, all else held equal, larger buildings are more valuable, but in reality, plots are quite small and built up in the urban core, while lots tend to get bigger and flatter as you move further out into modern suburbs. A grocery in the suburbs and the city may be quite similar on the inside, but the suburban one has a massive parking lot attached, while the urban one probably doesn't have any parking and might have additional stories on top for other uses. Even though the urban store takes up a lot less space, it's probably valued at a similar level as its suburban counterparts. Now, let's look at the blue line. As properties get bigger, their taxable value per acre decreases. This is pretty simple math. The taxable value per acre is just the total value of the property divided by the space it takes up. If you have the same value spread out over a larger area, as the green bars suggest, you have less tax revenue per acre. But why are we calculating tax value per acre? As I mentioned earlier, a city's infrastructure costs are determined more by how large the coverage area is than the number of buildings it has to cover. You're going to need a lot more road and pipe to hook up these eight homes compared to these eight homes. So if infrastructure costs are largely calculated by area, but tax revenue declines per area, well, you're going to have some issues with your revenues minus costs. So, there's a massive infrastructure money bomb that's already going off in slow motion across American suburbia, one that will require a massive increase in taxes just to keep basic operations running. One study of the city of Lafayette estimated that taxes would have to be tripled just to cover maintenance on existing infrastructure. The same is true for our national highway system. But that's where we run into the other brick wall of suburban finances. Cars. Suburbanization has made the car a necessity for most Americans. Except for a few large cities, you need one to go shopping, to socialize, and to get to work. Even in New York City, about 25% of commuters, or over a million people, drive to work alone every day. Elsewhere, there are mandatory life expense, which is really unfortunate because they're really expensive. You don't want to miss out on this next offer. In 2000, the total cost of car ownership was estimated by the AAA to be about $6,000 a year. Today, that's more like $9,000 a year. And that's from a car-friendly source. Keep in mind that the median American worker earns something like $31,000 a year as of 2019. For the median worker, that's a third of your income going to transportation alone. In contrast, yearly access to the CTA in Chicago one of America's better transit networks, costs just over $1,000 a year. For a real world-class system, like that in London or New York, it'll cost you about £2,300 or $2,400 a year, respectively. That's barely a quarter of what you're paying to deal with rush hour traffic on your local highway in suburban America, and less than 10% of the median income instead of over 30%. As several prominent urbanists point out in Suburban Nation, quote, at conventional mortgage rates, that figure, the difference in transit costs, translates into more than $60,000 of home purchasing power, unquote. So that foregoing two family cars could basically pay for a cheap house by itself. I mean, just think of what your family could do with $6,000 extra dollars a year. But we don't have the freedom to think about that. 
Because of the way we've built our nation, we've condemned most people to car ownership, even as our government finances bleed out onto our disintegrating streets. But there is a positive alternative. Throughout the 20th century, the suburb of Evanston, just north of Chicago, went through this process of sprawl and decay. Main Street was cannibalized by large shopping malls. People drove instead of taking existing mass transit. But sprawl was expensive, and even with Northwestern University providing a local economic anchor, Evanston was forced to more than double its property tax rate between 1965 and 1985, from $5 to $12 per $100 of property value. But in 1986, the city bucked the national trend and embraced a transit and density-oriented development policy, upzoning areas around downtown rail links and reducing parking minimums. Over the last 30 years, the policy has been a huge success, with car ownership dropping massively and a vibrant downtown developing. The city has even been able to cut its property tax rate down to only $8 per $100 of property value, significantly lower than many other suburbs around Chicago, though still higher than the property tax within the city itself. It was a long process, but you can't argue with results. A better future is possible.